Uh, so good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining today's CNCF webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, today's webinar is how to migrate databases into Kubernetes. I'm Christy Tan and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Alex Cherkoff, CEO and founder of Storage OS, and Ferran Castell, pro product reliability engineer at Storage OS. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk and as, a, as an attendee, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Alex and Ferran to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Thank you, Kirsty, and um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you're dialing in from. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alex Kirkop. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Storage OS. I also hold two hats um, and I'm the co-chair of the CNCF uh, Storage SIG. Um, and I am uh, very focused on, on building uh, cloud native storage uh, solutions uh, at Storage OS. Um, but before that, I spent 25 years um, engineering a number of different uh, infrastructure platforms um, primarily for financial services. Always happy to to hear uh, feedback from the community. So uh, feel free to uh, DM me or or join our Slack and uh, and and interact. Farhan, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure, Alex. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Farhan. Uh, I'm based uh, in London, uh, as our company, Search as is. I'm a, a platform reliability engineer or with a background on, on infrastructure and, and platform engineering. Um, we usually run a, a lot of infrastructure on, on clouds and bare metals. So, so my background is mainly on, on systems and, and a bit of DevOps as well. Brilliant. Thanks, both. Um, so before we start, um, I just want to give you a bit of background on, on Storage OS, uh, where we come from. So. Um, at Storage OS, we are building um, cloud-native platforms um, for customers and users who are who are running uh, platforms in the cloud, on-prem, or in hybrid environments. So, one of the things we come across very often is uh, customers wanting to run databases in Kubernetes. So, we're going to share some of the experiences. Um, as I mentioned, I've also got my other hat, so I'm going to do a, a little bit of um, uh, uh, SIG advertising here. Um, the, the CNCF Storage SIG is a, is a public group. Um, it, uh, it works um, with the CNCF uh, uh, TOC team um, and we help uh, create content for end users as well as um, review projects uh, and provide technical storage expertise to, to the SIG, to the, to the TOC. Um, the calls are open and are open every second and fourth Wednesday um, of the month. So we'd love to see you there. Um, okay, so I talked about um, what we're seeing uh, in, end, in our end users communities. Um, of course, everybody begins uh, their, their cloud native journey typically with, with containers and, and containers um, change the, 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 have changed the container landscape, have changed the application landscape because they've broken the dependencies between an application and an individual specific server. So, so this concept of, of cattle versus pets, which, which we hear about quite a bit. Um, containers allow uh, applications to be portable. And of course, the minutes applications are portable, they can be orchestrated. Um, and this is where Kubernetes comes in. So, so Kubernetes being that container orchestrator um, allows, uh, allows developers to be able to uh, compose and declare what they need out of their applications by defining, for example, compute requirements or, or, or network requirements. Um, and Kubernetes, I guess, plays like an expert uh, uh, Tetris uh, game with your applications to abstract away your infrastructure and fit the applications in the in the most efficient way 
to the to the available resources. And of course, because it has the automation, it can uh, do lots of uh, um, advanced services, you know, like uh, automating scaling and, and, and healing and connectivity. But of course, all applications store state somewhere. And one of the amazing things with uh, Kubernetes is how um, with the power of, of uh, new standards like, like CSI, um, Kubernetes can interface with um, different storage systems. So now developers can use um, cloud native storage um, functionality that, that will integrate um, with Kubernetes to not only automate their compute or networking, for example, but also to automate um, storage provisioning, availability, and, and, and scaling. Now, what does that actually mean in terms of um, in terms of an end user? So, so effectively, now that um, you can specify uh, storage requirements, um, it makes it very easy to move stateful applications into Kubernetes. Um, and because um, those uh, storage requirements and those uh, applications um, can be defined with um, a standard set of YAML, we 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 move to to the scenario where um, it's possible to build anything as a service, and and one of the one of the things that we see um, happening very re regularly is uh, the concept of of building databases as a service. So, why would you want to automate um, the deployment of of databases uh, in Kubernetes, and and what are some of the advantages um, in this? So, one of the one of the key things. Um, one of the key things with, with uh, Kubernetes and, and cloud native storage um, relates to um, the, this, this key concept that the containers and the applications are portable. So in this case, when I refer to an application, I'm, I'm talking about your database because um, every type of database is, is now uh, mostly available as, as a container too. So, um, you know, popular databases like uh, Postgres or, or MySQL, for example, um, as well as databases like, uh, say, Mongo or Cassandra, um, and uh, more distributed systems like, uh, like Vitesse, for example, um, are all deployed um, as containers uh, within Kubernetes environments. Um, one of the key things here, though, is that um, those applications, those, those databases, um, are inherently portable and they benefit from the ability for Kubernetes to dynamically scale out and scale down a cluster um, and to be able to upgrade nodes um, on the fly, whether it's um, because you want to upgrade the resources of nodes or you want to, um, uh, uh, you want to upgrade uh, nodes um, for, for, to make sure that software is current and, and security patches are applied, for example. So one of the key things to, to look out for here is to look for um, storage that is um, portable and supports the cloud native attributes of, of, that, um, of that type of application and database running in, in Kubernetes. So effectively we're moving from we're moving away from an environment where serv servers um, and storage are tightly coupled, where, where the storage is locked into individual server nodes. Um, and we're moving to, to um, an environment where um, the, the data and the storage is locked into the database and the application. And Kubernetes has the ability to move your application and therefore the storage um, is portable too. Um, we talked a lot about um, the fact that uh, in Kubernetes, the environments are declarative and reproducible. So what do we mean by that? Well, in much the same way that you can specify um, the containers that are needed, in this case, a database and, and the compute and memory and network requirements, you can also um, declare the storage requirements and uh, items like uh, scaling or, or availability, for example. Um, and the reason why this is um, so incredibly powerful is because it makes your environment um, uh, recoverable and reproducible. So you're no longer um, you no longer are nurturing individual servers, um, but Kubernetes has that power of of uh, of, of extending the database and and recreating that that environment wherever you are, uh, making it very easy to to have. Um, uh, 
pre-production or, or, or development and production environments um, replicated very easily. One of the other things which, um, which applies to databases in, in Kubernetes um, is the way you scale the, um, the, organ the, the, the deployments of those databases. Um, and we'll talk about the, that detail in a little bit, but, but effectively what we're, um, what, we're, what we're recommending is that you co-opt the same sort of concept as, as microservices, where, where effectively um, a database is no longer um, deployed in, in, in large, gigantic instances, but um, different, uh, different databases can be um, deployed in, in separate smaller instances and can be um, scaled out uh, horizontally with, um, with uh, uh, high, highly available or, or, or dynamically available um, database endpoints abstractions, um, allowing you to tune the workloads and, and to, to right size the environment appropriately. So we talked a bit about um, we talked a bit about how that dynamic provisioning um, works. So, so I'll give you um, a little example of of what we're referring to specifically for a database. So within a database, um, we start off with um, a storage class. A storage class is a way to um, abstract away the the, um, the definition for. Uh, accessing uh, a storage provider that Kubernetes is going to talk to. Now, we, we mentioned CSI. CSI is the container storage interface. Um, and this is the standardized API, uh, which is used by um, a number of different storage providers um, to provide the interaction to dynamically provision volumes, but also to, to dynamically attach, detach, and, and, and mount volumes uh, into different, uh, into different uh, nodes within your environment. Effectively, using a storage class, which is, which is an abstraction point for your storage provider, you can now um, define a persistent volume claim. That persistent volume claim um, uses, uh, uses the storage provider to dynamically provision um, a volume um, and is identified um, using, uh, using a, a friendly name, which you can then refer to in the, um, in the application itself, typically uh, defined in a pod or, or, or a stateful set. So in this case, for example, we're, we're showing the, the crunchy data um, uh, um, uh, example to, to, to define a Postgres uh, container that will use the, the database volume that we defined in the, um, in the persistent volume claim. The, the idea behind this is that um, we now have a, a very simple way to, to define um, the way the databases run and the volume requirements um, that uh, that is that, that are being used, um, and if you you were using um, a software defined uh, a storage system, um, you can also um, have the benefit of being able to use this the same YAML uh, configuration whether you're deploying say in a, in a cloud instance or on prem or, or or perhaps in 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 different VMs or developer environments for example. Um, I'm going to caveat this um, and say that um, many databases um, actually have um, a superset of automation nowadays uh, called an operator um, or, 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 or some sort of uh, capability to, to, to um, actually provide additional functionality around the life cycle of, of the database. Um, for, for the purposes of, of this particular uh, webinar and, and this example, we're, we're, we're um, restricting ourselves to um, give, providing examples that are related to starting a database using a simple pod or a stateful set, um, and that's mostly for for simplicity. But but I, for for completeness sake, I'm I'm mentioning the fact that you know operators are available for most uh, types of databases to provide that database lifecycle. So, what does it look like in terms of um, you know what we what we've seen uh, happen time and time again in in uh, different uh, enterprises and end user um, environments. So, so typically, um, we we start off with um, you know a, a, a large server or 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 a, or a, a service that has um, uh, potentially multiple databases hosted in in a single database instance, typically on a on a large node, um, and and that may or may not have. Um, you know, dedicated um, storage, or 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 may have um, you know some existing other storage provider. Um, the 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 point that I'm 
wanting to emphasize here is that most of this definition is now very, very server centric. Um, and it's based on a, on a scale up architecture, which, which obviously gets uh, more expensive based on, based on the, the capacity of those, of those individual servers. Um, but more than that, um, the, the, the functionality becomes, um, uh, becomes uh, operationally more complex um, and, uh, and, and, and prone to failure, simply because of the fact that, that we're talking about um, running multiple databases within, within that large instance. So every time a new database um, is required, it requires um, a fair amount of, of, of manual effort. Perhaps it, it involves um, uh, database administrators or, or DevOps teams to, to get involved. And, and of course, you know, um, potentially operational change windows um, for, for your database environment. So what does this look like in, in, in the new world? So starting off with that, um, large uh, database instance, we can, um, we, we then are looking at how we deploy this um, within our Kubernetes instance. For the sake of the, for the sake of this particular example, we're, we're using um, uh, storage OS as, as the underlying um, storage layer, but of course, um, other storage providers are available. Um, and we start off by moving a single um, database instance within a container that is now um, uh, runnable and, and accessible within the nodes, uh, within, within a node uh, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. And, and this, this is typically a pod or, or a stateful set that might be managed by an operator. We can then continue to break out the additional um, Kubernetes, uh, the, the, sorry, the additional uh, Postgres um, databases into their own mini instances, effectively making them portable standalone um, products that can be distributed across the different nodes in the cluster. So, so effectively, we're 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 using the the functionality um, of of Kubernetes to turn each database instance into um, a declarative uh, self-contained uh, container. Um, one of the one of the aspects um, of using um, the the uh, the provisions of the cloud native storage within Kubernetes is that a lot of the storage providers um, provide the the capability of of uh, having uh, primary volumes and, and 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 replica copies of, of that data in, in in some form that are that are distributed between the different nodes um, within the environment. What this means is that, uh, and again, using the, the the automation that's that's available through through CSI um, that allows uh, Kubernetes to to uh, to talk to the service to talk to the storage provider. Um, when a database is um, is 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 working with a, a copy of the data, um, the data can actually be replicated, and data protection can be um, can be applied such that uh, transactions are are being replicated to more than one node um, within the cluster. Um, and there are and, and again, there are a number of different um, software options that that allow you to do this. Um, and the the CNCF six storage has created um, uh, a white paper to describe the, the storage landscape in the CNCF, which is which is a good reference point that I'd recommend that you read. This type of data protection means that if um, if a, a database uh, commits a transaction to to the storage environment, that data is now available on multiple nodes within a cluster, which means that if um, a copy of that data fails, say due to a, a disk failure, a resource failure, or or, or, a, or a node uh, failure, um, that the database can continue to run transparently because the storage system is, is handling this in the background. So this gives um, additional options to, to some of the database uh, providers by providing storage level replication that's managed by Kubernetes uh, to protect your to protect uh, the databases um, within that within that Kubernetes environment. Of course, there are um, there are other projects, you know, like uh, like Vitesse, for example, 
um, that provide other methods of doing database level um, replication, which can also apply in these environments. But suffice to say that the, the whole concept of, of um, allowing the database within the Kubernetes environment um, to, to benefit from that uh, transparent replication means that you get automated failovers um, within your environment, especially because the database remains, um, oops, especially because the database remains uh, accessible um, via the um, the service accounts and the service IPs that are defined um, as part of the uh, as part of the the, the the pod or the stateful set. So, just summarizing, databases are of course um, stateful workloads and in order to take um, real advantage of these uh, Kubernetes workloads and Kubernetes environments, it's important that, um, that you are able to apply the same uh, declarative construct and composable construct um, that you apply to your, um, to your applications uh, uh, to, to, to the stateful uh, workloads too, like databases. Um, Containers are, of course, ephemeral, and, and nodes can be ephemeral, but, but using um, the capability of um, uh, software-defined storage within Kubernetes, we can ensure that there are multiple copies of your data, and data is accessible anywhere. Um, and, you know, I'm just re-emphasizing that um, CSI as, the, as a standard interface that Kubernetes uses to talk to um, storage providers has now been uh, around for uh, over two years as, as a GA um, function and uh, this provides uh, all of the benefits um, uh, to provide flexible storage for these environments to, to allow the databases to be, to be portable with dynamic provisioning. Um, one other, one other uh, a couple of other aspects that, that I'd like to cover is that by splitting out um, each um, database instance, each database into, into its own uh, separate uh, containerized uh, database uh, instance, we have um, better performance and better throughput, um, typically because uh, Kubernetes can now um, balance the loads more effectively into, into multiple instances. Um, we have um, we have the concept that um, each one of those database instances can be um, tuned and resources allocated um, uh, individually per database. So so you're not having to to worry about um, one large uh, instance for multiple databases. And of course, by by having uh, by scaling out horizontally rather than focusing on a vertical scale up with Kubernetes, um, you reduce the failure domains and you reduce the blast radius of of and, and the impact of of any one uh, components within within the cluster um, uh, failing. All right, so with that, I'm going to pass on to I'm going to pass the baton on to. Um, to uh, Ferran, uh, who's going to give us um, a live demo, um, talking, uh, um, providing a, a demo to show us how to actually move uh, a database from a standard server into uh, Kubernetes. So this is probably the exciting part uh, of the of the environment, and I'll pass over to Ferran now. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Alex. I'll start sharing mine. Second, great, cool. So. As Alex mentioned, we're going to go into a live demo. Uh, first of all, let me give you a bit of introduction. Uh, what we have, we have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, four nodes in Google Cloud, could be somewhere else, but Google Cloud is, is as good as, as any other. And we're going to do actually what Alex explained about mm, sending uh, the main data, a main database into multiple ones in Kubernetes. So we have one main server, with Postgres, uh, let's actually have a look. It's a, it's a standard uh, Ubuntu box with a Postgres running. So you can see just a simple process. It's just a, a standalone machine with a, with a Postgres um, and multiple Postgres databases. So let's have a look. We can see actually that we have multiple databases. Those databases or schemas, um, I created for, with ordinal numbers, those databases for, for simplicity, so we actually can see what we are migrating. But keep in, keep in mind or, or try to understand that this is something that we are creating a database for each microservice or for each component of our application or for each 
part of um, our holding, our company, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are different ways of distributing how our data is stored. So I'm gonna move all these databases, which I will understand each database is a microservice into Kubernetes. So I'm gonna use K instead of kubectl to save everyone's time. Um, just bear with me. So I created the namespaces. So we have one namespace per microservice. Very simple. Um, we want to keep isolated them. And when they can access through the network, um, one component to the other, we keep them separate. Um, by the way, everything I'm going to use today is available in GitHub, and we're going to share the, um, the links for, for the YAMLs, etc. And I want to encourage that everything you see today is something that I highly recommend to use into CI CD environments. So we're going to do it by hand. So you actually can see what is uh, under the hood or, or um, in the Kubernetes constructs, but you use, you, you would use a CI CD or Jenkins server, whatever tool you prefer to actually run those automations. It will make your life way, way easier. So first of all, I'm going to deploy um, a Postgres server on every single one of these namespaces. So we're going to have, 10 databases or 10 instances of Postgres itself. To do so, I'm gonna use these uh, YAMLs that as I said, they're in a GitHub repository completely public. And, um, and then we're gonna migrate the data. So I'm gonna iterate over them and just create the resources. Um, in a second, I'm just gonna show um, what actually are we doing. So to be able to provision um, databases, as Alex mentioned before, we're going to use stateful sets. Every stateful set is a Kubernetes controller um, that will enforce certain uh, requirements. For instance, the amount of instances of the application. So let's have a look at the uh, stateful, cell, stateful set itself. As I said, this is a Kubernetes controller that will enforce, in our case, to have one instance of the application always running we are using a fairly standard or fairly common um, Postgres instance. And very importantly, we're gonna mount a volume into PG data, into slash PG data. That is where Postgres will write the data. If you wanna use uh, and split the write ahead log um, and all other components that uh, Postgres allows for speed or whatever, you can do that here, create different volumes. Because this is declarative, it's very easy to just provision your volumes. Um, where are the volumes coming from? These volumes are coming from a template. That template is a persistent volume claim template. So for every application, for every pod that this controller starts, it will have one persistent volume claim always associated to it. In this case, uh, we're just referencing the storage class that we want to use for our um, uh, for our software defined storage backend, but there are actually different ones in this cluster. So we have multiple. Um, there are two of them that are uh, software based, and there is one actually that is the, the world cloud uh, volumes. So you can, and actually you can add more and create different storage classes that will actually have different capabilities or options for, for your specific use case. Now, Let's actually have a look at the pods that we have created. I'm going to use K9S, which actually is a very cool tool um, for, for live uh, information. I'm searching for up. Um, we can see that for every namespace, there is one pod, one Postgres pod for every single one of those microservices. So now every microservice can have its own database. Cool. Every one of those databases have a volume associated. Let's say app three to say something, get PVC. And we can see that there is a PVC associated to it. So now we have 10 instances of Postgres running and it, they have 10 volumes associated to each other. Cool, now we have Postgres running, we have the main server running. Now let's run the migration. Uh, let's see, let's see for, for instance, uh, let me show you in the instance itself before we do the migration, some data that actually is in this, in this table. So actually we can relate later about them. 
uh, let's connect to uh, one of the applications, let's say app two. Uh, let's see, there is one table, it actually it's just random data. And there is just blob files and inf blob um, information. There is no real use, but we will be able to see that this table actually is migrated along to this to the database itself. Cool. As I said, it's very important that you guys use CI/CD for these kind of tools or for these kind of executions. I'm going to do now. Um, there is one thing that we actually need to have before we do the, um, the import itself. And that is a way to connect our um, Postgres servers, our many instances in Kubernetes to the main server. We do that using these exter the external service. It's a standard YAML. If you're not familiar with external services with Kubernetes, don't worry too much. Just for context, what we are doing is we are telling Kubernetes that there is an IP that we want to access from inside the cluster, but we want to give it a name. So instead of accessing the IP itself of the Postgres server, the main server, we are creating an endpoint and a, spe a special service that, will, uh, that allows us to um, access those, uh, that main server from a DNS name inside the cluster. So we keep uh, good practices and an elegant um, distribution of concerns. So actually, I have a namespace that has that service. So we can see that a service called PG, so we're gonna access PG.namespace, so PG.postgres external, and that will forward into that specific um, Postgres database. So if we see the endpoints, actually it's mapped to a specific IP where my Postgres server is running. Cool. This is important because when we want to do things from an automated point of, uh, of view, we want to change configuration while we don't have to change anything else. So how are we going to run the migration? I'm going to use a job. A job is a Kubernetes construct or a Kubernetes controller that will execute my container or in this case, my, my task once. What this task does is a simple PG dump and pipe to PG restore. Um, of course, if you have big databases, I have small databases today, but if you have big databases, you can um, add uh, the size of the migration in here or the size of every chunk of data that is migrated so you can control a bit of the, the flow on, on the data and, and be more sophisticated with that. But essentially, it's very simple. There is a source, a source and a destination where these source and destination variables come from. They come from configuration, as actually it's quite common and quite obvious, but sometimes we just want to keep these, these jobs as agnostic as possible. And through configuration, we will be able to run this. So we will create one of these jobs for every namespace. So we will um, do an import, an independent import for every uh, database that we have. So let's have a look actually at the config map. The config map itself is, again, it's quite simple. We have a database. This is only one database, so we will have to use some templating and some or, or patching to be able to specify the source database that we want to migrate. User and password, of course, use secrets for this. This is just a demo. Um, the source and the destination, and this is very important. The source and the destination are those DNS names I was mentioning before. The source is this external name that points to the main Postgres server, while destination is the name of the pod dot the service. Because I'm using a stateful set along a headless service, which is a, a service that goes along with the stateful sets, I can always access my application with the same name, pod name dot service name. Because this pod will run in the same namespace as every database, it will always connect to the right one because I'm, I don't have to specify the namespace itself. So with this, the only thing we need to do is a patch. So let me create the config map and then I'll show you how to patch it. Loop. So let's iterate once again over all the namespaces. So 
So one config map per namespace, 10 config maps in the end. And now let's apply Apache. Apache is a simple um, Kubernetes, um, I could say construct, but um, it's a way that we can alter the YAMLs themselves. Of course, you can use, for instance, Customize or Helm or any tool that you find or you prefer for your own um, templating. I just want to keep it simple. And on the other hand, you can do that from a CI CD point of view. Very easy to do that. You have your applications or microservices listed, you simply iterate over them and you tell every configuration or every um, application which configuration has to apply. So we applied the patch. Let's have a look at one of them. So we have the main Postgres and the Postgres migration. Great, we can see that in namespace app one, we have the database app one. Quite simple, but actually this allows us to be agnostic as, and run that as many places as we want. Now we have to just create the job for every namespace. Let's iterate over the namespaces once again and create the job. Well, they are created, let's go and keep looking at the um, real time information. We can see that the populate itself, you can see there are different ones and for every namespace, we keep having one. Actually, because obviously the data is quite small, they're finishing fairly fast. Let's have a look at the logs of, um, of one of them. Let's say up six logs. And we can see simple PG restore restoring our data, the database my data. So now let's go into one of the applications themselves. Let's get a shell into them. And let's get a shell. And we can see that in app two, we have only one database. Instead of having 10, we have one. Let's connect to it. we have the same data as before. Something fairly trivial, it's just a PG restore. In our case, PG restore is not blocking. So for production, it's, it's pretty all right. Um, for other databases like MySQL, if you use MySQL down, be careful because that's blocking. There are different tools. Um, so adapt to your, your specific use case. As, as always in engineering, uh, we have to always find the best solution for our use case, not for every, someone else's use case. So pretty much we have now 10 databases with their own applications and they are segmented. So we just migrated in a matter of 14 minutes while I was talking um, databases from one big instance that can be difficult to maintain, difficult to upgrade to multiple um, databases where their concern is a split. Let's say that app one, for instance, is very intense on reads. That application, that database, can be scaled for reads, can be improved um, to, to scale better for reads. Let's say we can add read replicas or we can scale the size of that uh, stateful cell or the pot itself to scale horizontally to make it bigger. Or um, we can specify different, um, different, um, different configuration. While maybe app two has a different concern, for instance, is a microservice for user logins where latency is not as important but consistency is really, really highly important. Backups don't have to be at the same time. We have a different concern. We have different tuning options. We can improve our availability and actually the blast radius of that, the, the, our databases. If our main big instance of Postgres goes down, even it's a cluster itself, if we have a problem with that cluster, we will end up with a situation where all our information, all our services are down. With this model, of course it has caveats. There is an overhead of running a database that depends on your use case and how you want to split that. You will have a better um, scalability and, and a better microservice architecture in, in my opinion, at least. Cool. So um, the demo is, um, is pretty over. We can, we can keep going and, and start doing things to, to, to databases, but I think it's a good time to pass to the uh, Q and A. So if you have any questions about the demo, Feel free, I can reshare my screen once again 
and, um, and, answer, and answer them online or on the command line. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Ferran. Um, we've had uh, a few questions come in, so um, uh, we, can, we can go through them. Um, one, uh, Olivia um, asked if um, we can share the, the repo that we're using um, for, the, for the use case. Um, so perhaps if you can send that uh, to, the, to the chat window and, I'll, and, and I can uh, mention that. Um, we also had uh, a question around uh, what is the opinion about local PV for, for Postgres with um, replicas such as Crunchy or with Stalin implementation? So this is this is a question that that, that comes up um, that comes up fairly often, right? We we often um, we often uh, um, have uh, a discussion about the pros and cons of of different instances. Effectively, if you are um, thinking of a database like um, Postgres, um, availability uh, can be done at at the Postgres level with with replication. At the database level, it can also be done at the storage level. Um, or perhaps it can be done with with, with both. Um, the each each of those um, each of those options um, has uh, perhaps different use cases. So using um, a local uh, a local PV, which is effectively um, a disk that's only available on an individual node, um, means that that Postgres instance is is very tightly coupled to that to that node, and it does make um, uh, services like like failover a bit more a bit more complicated. If the disk on that particular node um, is uh, uh, fails, it means that that um, it's not straightforward to move the database to another node. Of course, you can do database level replication in that instance, and then have um, and then recover to to another database. But that said, you are now managing two sets of databases um, and two sets of compute resources because um, both databases have to be up to do replication. Um, on the flip side, if you're using um, a storage system that's providing um, storage level uh, replication, you know, and, and again, there are there are a number of different um, options how to do that. You tend to have better portability, so um, databases can um, database instances can move around horizontally across the different nodes within the cluster. Um, and additionally, you have uh, you have the benefit that you have uh, an extremely low um, recovery time if a database instance uh, actually fails, so say a node or, or 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 a data set fails, because one of the one of the things that that we do come across um, quite a lot is what is um, how 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 does a failure affect the, the the deterministic performance or the recovery process um, of of a database? So, for example, if you have a very small database and you're doing database level um, replication, then if a database fails, um, it might be quite quick to to um, to sync up another replica of a database. But if the database is large, um, that you know, creating another uh, replica instance of the database could could take a long time, and, and and potentially that impacts performance. You know, from a from a disk and from a network resource point of view, while that recovery is happening. So so that's also another reason why you know we, we we've seen um, end users deploy both database level replication and or disk um, uh, level replication uh, in, in in both of those instances. Um, we have had another question to, sorry, go on. Um, I was about to ask uh, the, one of the questions uh, actually for you, Alex, because you are here, you know quite a bit about this. What's the preferred storage uh, selected to deploy storage for stateful databases? SAN, NAS, DAS, what's the best recommendation? That's actually a really good question as well. It, it, it is a good question. So um, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> and, and I'll and I'll I'll I'll, I'll 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 sort of expand on that slightly. So, um, in the past, we've often thought of um, the attributes of a storage system um, in terms of how 
the access method for that storage system is defined, right? So um, SAN being sort of block-based devices or, or NAS being, for example, a, a file system-based device or, 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 or DAS being directly attached storage to an individual node. Um, the, the reality is though in, in, in a Kubernetes type environment, um, we have um, a lot more layers to a storage system. So I guess the important thing to understand first is what are the attributes um, of your database or your application? Often databases um, may not necessarily be um, may not necessarily uh, be optimized for throughput, but they probably are. Uh, they they probably do require um, lower latency if if they are to handle transactional performance, for example. Um, and and also databases um, typically have uh, storage attributes that require um, strong consistency for for data integrity and strong data durability. Um, all of these different attributes, by the way, are are, are well defined in the in the CNCF um, uh, storage landscape, which which we publish um, on the CNCF uh, storage sig, um, and we define these different attributes and explain the different layers within the storage system that contribute to these attributes. So one of the things that um, that changes quite uh, quite dramatically in in cloud native world is that because of those layers, it's no longer safe to assume that the way you consume the storage, say via a, a block, a distributed block system, or, or say a file system, um, is uh, defines the attributes such as performance or, or latency. Because for example, we see file systems that are sometimes built on top of object stores. So it might have the file sharing cap attributes of a file system, but the latency attributes of an object store, for example. Um, and therefore, what you really need to do is just understand the attributes of the storage system in relation to what you need out of your databases. Typically, databases, as I mentioned, require the low latency and the high consistency. Um, and therefore, you're, you're looking at um, a storage system that can provide um, strong consistency and, um, and, and uh, deterministic latency within these environments. So um, that, would, that would tend to naturally um, select distributed block systems, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Um, may I answer one of the questions, um, Alex, while, while you go through the other, if that's okay? Of course, go for it. There is a question talking about um, uh, the size of the persistent volume in the context of databases in Kubernetes. Um, that is definitely a situation where it's not easy to, to know which kind of size you want to put. Obviously, persistent volume claims are declarative, and when they are declarative, uh, you have to set them at bootstrap. So when you create the PVC, you set that image, that size. Of course, you don't know how it grows. You cannot just go plug this. In, in fact, most or, or some of the storage providers for Kubernetes implement resize of PVCs. So if your database runs out of the space because you put 25 gigs and it's not enough, most of, or, or I would say most, but some of the, the solutions, more, mostly the, um, the software defined storage solutions allow resize of PVCs. So it couldn't really be a problem for that. Of course, the answer is it depends on the size of your database and your data for each date, for, for each data set. But in the end, you can just resize based on, on the storage provider. Yeah, that's that that's brilliant. Um it's it's um it's fantastic to see the continued development of, of CSI and um and how this enables uh sort of the day two operations like like resize. Um it's it's sort of key to to day to day operations. Um hey Farhan, one of those questions is for you. Um so uh, a user has asked um is it possible to um, to replicate uh, data from an on-prem database to a Kubernetes databases um, in order to to uh, to require minimum downtime? Yeah, hundred um, percent. The what we did today was no more than connecting one application to another. We didn't care about the infrastructure. We just needed, obviously, the plumbing of or the network in between. So as soon as your Kubernetes cluster 
can access, whether if you have a VPN access in between instances, they are in the same subnets, or they're visible through the network from your bare metal through VPN, for instance, to a cloud environment or wherever it is, uh, you can just configure uh, one of these databases to pull that data uh, to replicate from, from that master. Um, from a Postgres point of view, that's not problematic. Actually, it's fairly easy. It's a synchronous. When it's ready, it's ready. The only thing you have to do is set up the configuration. We created a config map. Well, I didn't show the config map today, but when we created stateful set to create the, the application itself, the, the Postgres application, that has a config map, which in there you can specify all the configuration. And you can configure there a slave or, or more commonly called a, a, a passive um, instance of a master. So I could highly recommend though, if you do that and you have higher latencies, more than five, six milliseconds to do a synchronous and to do a transaction log um, replication through Postgres, for instance, is good enough for that. If you create synchronous replication um, in between a, um, a data center and a cloud provider that, or, or something that is far apart, you will struggle a bit with performance because the latency affects the input output operations on synchronous replication. Brilliant. Thanks, Ferran. Um, we've also had a follow-up question on the database um, sizing. Um, the, the, the question is about what is the recommended size um, of database storage to be effective in, in a Kubernetes database? Um, I think that's, that's a fairly open-ended question. Um, the, I don't think you know, there is a specific size that we would necessarily um, recommend. Um, it, it can be as small as a, a few gig all the way up to you know, several terabytes based on you know, the actual size of your database. However, that said, um, one of the things that is worth understanding is, um, again, how size translates to um, the different attributes within, within your storage system. So for example, um, depending on the storage provider, um, you may you might find that um, uh, perhaps there are uh, uh, IOP thresholds or, or input output operation thresholds um, or, or megabyte per second throughput thresholds um, that are correlated to the to the size of the volume. So so sometimes um, you may find yourself having to um, over provision the size of the volume to ensure that. You have um, you have the the correct uh, number of IOPS uh, available to 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 run your database, um, but that is definitely a factor which is you know very specific to the to the particular um, storage provider. Okay, Alex, if um, I'm gonna shoot a question to you, what is the overhead in terms of memory CPU to deploy? storage OS on all the nodes of the cluster in specifically in Kubernetes? Um, so, so specifically with storage OS, um, storage OS is, is um, built to be um, extremely low overhead. Um, so, you know, we, storage OS can, can typically run with um, a single core and, and maybe a gig or two of RAM, depending on the, depending on the amount of uh, activity. Um, so, so storage OS will will largely coexist with uh, additional workloads which are running on the cluster, and and typically it's often deployed in a, in a hyperconverged um, type of topology where um, nodes are used to provide um, storage to the pool, but also for those nodes also run um, the same applications that 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 run on the pool. Of course, the amount of um, CPU uh, that any storage system um, utilizes uh, will be will be tied to the actual amount of activity. Of course, if if um, if there's lots of uh, IOPS or or you know a, a high number like hundreds of thousands of IOPS, you'll you'll, you'll see higher higher CPU um, uh, uh, contention by the storage system. So we had um, another question around uh, container attached storage. So, so container attached storage is a term um, that's used uh, that's used by 
um, a number of software defined um, storage providers where those storage providers are actually providing um, storage uh, 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 are actually deployed as a container and providing storage to to a cluster that way um, I think the answer to this to this question is in terms of does container attached storage um, lend itself to databases the answer is obviously yes um, there are a number of um, CNCF projects you know like um, like Longhorn which which falls in, into this uh, category as well as you know a number of different um, uh, vendor supported uh, projects like storage OS that work in this method and effectively um, create uh, um, volumes out of the available storage on uh, individual nodes um, within within the cluster. So yes, I think it is a particularly good fit for databases. It's a very common um, use cases, uh, uh, things like databases and, uh, and maybe message queues are, are one of the most common use cases in terms of stateful workloads that move into Kubernetes first. Um, and um, a lot of the services offer um, some, you know, more advanced functionality, like uh, which we haven't talked about today, but the things like affinity and locality, which, which provide uh, additional benefits to to databases within, um, within the Kubernetes um, environment. Um, we also have uh, another question around. Um, is it possible to run a Postgres cluster um, like a primary replica set up in Kubernetes? Uh, and also, how would you load balance it and shard it? Farhan, is that something you can cover? Uh, yeah, one second. I was answering one of the one of the, um, the answers. Uh, sorry, one of the, the questions on, on the chat. So yeah, about uh, you you mentioned about the primary replica setup, right? Yeah. Uh, let me let me re-ask the question aloud. Um, is it possible to run PostgreSQL cluster like primary replica setup in Kubernetes, also how load balance and sharding work in Kubernetes? Kubernetes, I would say, that is no different from running that in a different server. What happens is that you have an orchestrator that will leverage uh, the startup of applications anywhere in the cluster real fast. And that's that's fantastic. You no longer have nodes tied to applications. You have applications tied to resources. So storage is a resource, no different from CPU or memory. Um, so when you're asking for storage itself, if you have a system that gives that storage, as actually what I was doing today with the PVCs, you're just asking for capacity and, and the storage system is giving you that capacity. Running the application on top of this is no different than running it somewhere else. In fact, because Kubernetes gives you the networking interface and the DNS itself is actually very easy to configure uh, primary replicas or read replicas or active passive model. Uh, actually, I would say read replicas it's easy, active passive use a storage system because that will be way more difficult um, and it's done for you so you don't actually need to do. So when we're thinking about primary and replicas, you can configure very, very easy uh, a service that is for the primary and then another service let's say a stateful set with a headless service, then it's very easy to configure uh, another deployment or stateful set that holds replicas. I would say a stateful set. You can have a stateful set and scale that to 10 uh, instances if you want. So you would have the primary stateful set and the replica stateful set. Tiny bit of configuration to sync all the data or, or to put configuration for the syncing using DNS names that they never change, whether even though the applications, the pod restarts here and there, that doesn't change. Kubernetes handles that front-end DNS for you. And then you can just access um, the replicas through one service called read replicas.postgres and the main one to main.postgres to say something. Um, then when it comes to sharding and things like that, you can do exactly the same. Uh, the load balancers that run in Kubernetes, it's a, it's a level four load balancing. So it's based on networking. It's not really... Um, you can configure that if you want, but you don't need to. You can configure a load balancer itself physically, um, but you don't need to because all everything is handled, whether, it's, whether it is with IPVS or IP tables or different components of the CNI, the access to the network you can do by name. So when you have to shard, you, you will um, hit any of the pods that serve a service. So when you have to shard, 
you have to keep the sharding in your own uh, application or Postgres can do that for you because the routers are in front and they're front-ended. If you use, for instance, Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch does something similar. You hit some front-end part of the application that knows where the back-end data is and it does all the aggregation when it comes to sharding, etc. So it's fairly easy and in fact, I would say that it makes your life easier to run these kind of uh, infrastructure components in Kubernetes, at least in my opinion. Fantastic. And I think that covers um, all of the open questions and puts us neatly just a little bit over time. Yeah, perfect. Thank you again, both, um, for the great presentation today. Is there um, uh, maybe your Twitter handles or a Slack link that you want to share with folks in case they have lingering questions after the webinar? Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, drop those in the chat. Oh, orange slide works too. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I shared <laughs> the, uh, the GitHub repo as well in the chat and in the questions. Awesome, so, so we're, we're all 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 of our engineers and Ferran and myself are are available on uh, Slack dot uh, and all the demos and use cases um, are available in the documentation on our website. Um, I would happily. Uh, discuss uh, use cases and um, different options for moving databases into Kubernetes. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks Thank everyone Goodbye. again for attending. Um, we hope to see you at a future CNCF webinar. A reminder that the uh, slides and recording will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page. Take care everyone and stay safe. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>